Okay, so good morning, Stephanie. Good and morning. Welcome to Fight the Virus. It's uh, uh, the, the call that we started to run actually in 2020 because we wanted to listen to the feedback of the experts. Uh, so despite uh, the, the virus and, and the fact that most of us needed to, to stay at home. So we are very glad uh, also because this is our first interview of the channel in, in, uh, in English. So, but, but the fact that your second name, uh, it's, it sounds like Italian, it's, it's a very <laughs> good <laughs> way to, to keep it off. And uh, so Stephanie, I would like you just to introduce yourself. So I'm sure that uh, I will not miss anything about your role and your, and your background. Um, well, I'm Stephanie DeLuca. I am an associate professor at the Freeland Biomedical Research Institute, which is part of Virginia Tech. And I also have um, appointments at the uh, School of Neuroscience of Virginia Tech and in the uh, Department of Pediatrics with the School of Medicine um, associated with the Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine. So that's me in a nutshell, officially. That's my all my academic uh, accolades. Besides that, I am a mother of um, four children and two grandchildren. Um, and I have worked uh, with children who have neuromotor disorders for almost 30 years. Um, I uh, started off working with adults who had had stroke and then transitioned into working with children. And that's become the passion of my career. And my children would even argue that it's a passion of my life because I really believe that we um, can change the things that we um, do for children. And, um, and, and I think every child should have the opportunity to maximize their development. And I just believe that we should use science to further that process. So, so that's me in a nutshell. So th thanks, Stephanie. Uh, indeed, uh, we, we totally agree on what you said, that uh, compared to adults, uh, even if we realize that uh, pediatric stroke uh, can be uh, a massive burden uh, for, for a family when the diagnosis uh, arrives, so we also recognize that in these children there's a lot of potential. So uh, if we are uh, really able to exploit this potential in the early age, uh, uh, so we, we can have uh, great results and great uh, satisfaction for, for all of us. So we studied, uh, we, we, we have your book here. Uh -huh. <laughs> because uh, we wanted uh, just at the, the very beginning uh, uh, to clarify some of the vocabulary that we are going to use uh, right now talking about intensive treatments for children with cerebral palsy. So there are some acronyms that um, maybe some Italian people do not know well or I, so I just want to make sure I, I will read it and then then let me know if they're right. So we'll talk about CAIMT. This is the right spelling of uh, of constraint induced movement therapy. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Habit and our B manual intensive therapy, and we also added uh, the habit heel, so the hand arm B manual intensive therapy, and including lower extremity. I don't know if this is also the field of your expertise or. Uh, in, in your lab, you are more focused on the upper limbs. So we have been most focused on the upper limb. We have done some kind of whole body um, intensive therapies, which is similar to the um, habitel with the lower extremity. Although I think there, um, the habitel for the lower extremity was focused on making changes in the lower extremity. Um, so we haven't done as much of that. We've been more focused on the upper extremity, so we've used habit in that we've used bimanual approaches and um, pediatric constraint-induced movement therapy. And then we've done some whole body for children who have um, more um, global impairments, so who are quadriplegic or have other types of diagnosis that have global developmental delay. So they are, are more cross-domain and not just lower extremity. Does that right. make sense? Yes, yes, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. So let's go to the first question. We collected uh, a few questions from, from our family 
And, and, and the first one was, uh, of course, concerning uh, intensive therapies. So why do we feel that uh, intensive therapies, especially regarding uh, motor learning, are so important for people with, uh, with cerebral palsy? Well, I thought about how to answer that question. And I think at the, you know, um, at the heart of it, I believe intensive therapies allow children um, to maximize, it's a way to maximize their, their learning and maximize their development. Um, so I think that's the reason that all the science indicates that um, we can make changes at greater levels um, in children who have a particular diagnosis that impacts their motor abilities by doing these intensive epics of therapy. Um, so that's really why they're important. They, they make greater changes than a distributed practice model of therapy, which was an hour of, or two of therapy a week that has um, been historically part of the rehabilitation community. But I also think there's another um, important component to this question that intensive therapies and the research into intensive therapies has really um, ch challenged all of us in the rehabilitation community to rethink what we were doing. And so I even think the distributed practice models of therapy in the last 10 and 15, 20 years have gotten a lot better because there was this intensive therapy body of research that was saying, oh, we can make a difference. So I think that intensive therapies have been important in that aspect too, is that it's really challenged our previous schools of thought in science and in our clinical practices to say, we, we shouldn't just be um, focused on the status quo and teaching children to cope and things of that nature and families to cope, but that we can really make a difference if we try and that, we should also incorporate science. So I think that it's important for both of those reasons that it's impacted the science and the clinical communities. And of course, at the heart of it though, is that what keeps us going, what keeps me going is that I see changes in kids and I see changes at a different level than in a distributed practice model. Yes, it, it reminds me when I started this path with my own son, with uh, with Mario, that uh, the specialists so around 10 years ago, they were saying, let's use the uh, wait and see approach. Yeah. I, I was so surprised. So what are we waiting for? <laughs> what do we expect if we are not doing anything? So I, I also appreciate the, the, the work that you as a scientist, as researchers have done lately, also on uh, uh, putting a lot of efforts on investigating how rich could be, could be the potential. And uh, uh, Stephanie, would you like to mention also the iAcquire project? Uh, because I understood that it's a very big project uh, in US. I would say that the biggest one concerning this type of, uh, of treatment, right? Yeah, so the iAcquire project is our newest project and we are about at 37% enrollment. So we, um, it's actually a multi-site project and it's unique in comparison to our previous projects um, by a couple of different ways. It is um, looking at two different dosages of constraint-induced movement therapy um, in comparison to traditional practice, but it's actually occurring at 14 different sites across the US. So we have um, uh, sites as far away from, we're in Virginia on the East Coast and we have sites in California. We have sites um, in, in Boston and Philadelphia and um, just several different places uh, around the country. So it's creating more access for families, but it is also, um, the largest trial that has focused on infants. So there has been a few studies in recent times um, that have uh, looked at infants in CIMT, but historically, most of the studies on um, constraint-induced movement therapy in children was aimed at uh, children who were above two. So the, the most common age was two to, two to about five, eight were involved in most studies. And so we're just now in the past 10 years begin to really try to say, can we use this treatment approach with younger children? And like so a, I what is the, the so-called uh, baby CMT? Right, it, so, yeah. so this is originally was aimed at children eight months to 
uh, 24 months. It's now up to 36 months. We uh, up the age a little bit because we got worried about recruitment during COVID. As it turns out, we haven't really had any problem recruiting, but it is now aimed at children eight months to 36 months. But it's also unique because um, it's the uh, first phase three trial in um, the US on infant rehabilitation, really on pediatric rehabilitation at all. And what that means is that um, a phase three trial says that you are that much closer to practice. If you are at, if, a, if, if one or both of these dosages of CIMT show efficacy, then phase three means that it's crossed a certain level of threshold that we should then begin to implement it into our clinical facilities. And so that's exciting. So that that part of, uh, of, of guidelines. So the next guidelines could. Uh... Absolutely. So it, it's a one step closer to being um, implemented and having things like insurance companies and things of that nature and third party reimbursers be able to cover it. So it really um, um, gets at the next level that we've been looking for. And, you know, I think it won't just, uh, even though this trial is aimed at infants, I think it will have applicability to other ages of children as well. Um, there's a large body of, of support for constraint induced movement therapy, as you know, and, um, and we're at a point where we really have to take that body of research and figure out how we can make it, um, how we can implement it so that every child that could benefit from it receives it. Great. Uh, again, uh, going back to my early years with, with Mario, I remember that at that time, uh, uh, constraint uh, therapy was not uh, uh, and a uh, recommended therapy for the children, at least here in, uh, in Europe, in Italy. So I'm, I'm so glad that uh, now it's uh, it also our uh, guidelines are uh, taking advantage of all the other research studies all around the world and in Australia too, in order to include this, uh, include this treatment. But uh, Stephanie, are, are you also recruiting uh, children coming from abroad? Uh, so if they are willing to stay in uh, in US for the I acquire? Absolutely, we don't have any, there's no restrictions on um, families that if their children meet, uh, they've had, a, it is aimed at ischemic stroke, which is one thing that many families don't understand before. So you can have an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, Right now, we wish we could open it up to everything, but and we hope to do a try a similar trial aimed at just hemorrhagic stroke, but it is aimed at ischemic stroke. But in answer to your question, as long as families, the children meet the uh, inclusion exclusion criteria, they can come from anywhere. The biggest thing we want to make families aware of is that while there's no charge for the treatment itself, then they have to commit though to the um, travel to come for not only the treatment, but the assessment period. So there's um, four or five different assessment periods, depending on which group children are assigned to. So they have an assessment period prior to treatment, an assessment period after treatment, and then a, an assessment period at six months and 12 months after treatment. And those, um, those follow-up assessments only take a couple of days, so the treatment period is a month. Um, but even though those uh, follow-up assessments seem like, oh, you know, they're, you know, the six months and the 12 months, you don't really need to know that. It's very important to the trial because we powered this trial to say that we not only want to understand if we're having short-term benefits on children, but we want to understand if we're having long-term benefits. Um, most of the CIMT research has uh, do, does follow children for six months, but we don't really have any longer term um, understanding of do these gains maintain. We, we have suggestions in the research through repeated treatments and things of that nature, but we don't have that confirmatory information. And so we really want to make sure, and this, this trial, for example, will be considered a failure if children don't maintain gains at the six months. Um, and so we, we really want to understand that. And, and that's an important piece even for the implementation portion of it clinically. So um, 
so we welcome families from anywhere and they can go to any of the 12, any of the, there's actually 14 sites now on, on the trial. They can go to any of those sites, but we do need them to understand that they're committing to all four points in the process. And I said okay. five points because if children are, it, there's one group of children that get usual and customary care to begin with, but then after six months, they receive the intensive CIMT. So all children get the CIMT services at either the um, the three hour a do, uh, three hour a day dosage or the six hour a day dosage. And also, this is a, a, a good news for the for for the families. So we we are going to share also the recruitment criteria and, and all the details in case those family wants just to spend uh, from one month to a recurring visit uh, uh, period uh, up to two years, I do understand, you know, uh, from the six months follow up and 12 months uh, follow up. So that there could be family willing to to travel for this. So we are, we are happy to share also this, uh, this information. So we started to introduce the fact that uh, uh, how earlier uh, we we start uh, on on motor rehabilitation uh, and how bigger could be the the results. But is this is there any uh, deadline or any age uh, up to this? Uh, uh, it, it's not recommended to have intensive treatments like CIMT or uh, habit. Mm -hmm. Is it so? Um, if I understood your question, you're saying is there a point when you shouldn't do it? Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's 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 good news to that uh, equation in that, um, you know, I started this work with adults and even with adults um, who were sometimes 18 years post stroke, um, we could see changes. Um, so I don't think that I can honestly say that science suggests there's an endpoint where you shouldn't do it. Um, what I can say, though, is I think that. Um, uh, we also understand that generally earlier you get greater uh, changes. So, um, uh, so that's why we want to understand in infants. So uh, I think what parents have to consider is whether, you know, what the types of gains that might be depending on the age of the child and the other aspects of the child's life. Um, one of the things that I think is great about considering therapies in a, a like CIMT or habit as an intensive burst is you're really focused for that period of time. In our case, it's usually a month, but then you also have the opportunity to allow your child to just go and be a child the other times versus having, you know, okay, I have to do therapy every every week at this time of an hour and you know if that interferes with a play date or ball practice or so it really can be cumbersome to have these distributed practices versus okay I can kind of forget therapy for a little while if I do them in these intensive first so I think that there's some good news and that I don't know that there's an ending point but I always want families to consider what else they're giving up because this is one motor development is one aspect of their child's life and my goal is not to have them just focus on their motor development my goal is to help them maximize their motor development so that they can maximize their overall life um, so i want families to consider you know is it more important for for my child to focus on academics or is it more important for my child to be involved with sports or, you know, do we have a major family vacation that this is the only time we could do it that, you know, the family is important. So we need to focus on that family vacation. So I just think if parents want to do it as children get older, they have so many more aspects of their life that they want them to consider. But it doesn't mean that they can't benefit, especially if a child has a very specific skill. Um, as often as children get older, they begin to recognize skills they want to work on. So one, exactly. of my, one of my first questions to any child that's over the age of five really is, okay, I want to talk to your parents, but I want to talk to you. You know, tell me right. what you want to get out of this. Um, and so because their buy-in is important. And so I want parents to think through that process with their children as they get older. 
Yeah, so I, I totally agree on the auto determination of, of, of children and, and young adults on, on this, of course. So how, let's go straight to the, the type of treatment. So how intensive therapies uh, max, allow for maximizing uh, learning? So we're still trying to understand that scientifically. Uh, I, I can't give you a hard, uh, hard and say this is how it happens scientifically because we just don't know. Um, I think one of the things that will lead us to that knowledge eventually is imaging studies but they're kind of few and far between. So we, I think what, what I can say confidently is that there's, there's a handful of, of neuroimaging studies now that suggest that intensive therapies are in, encouraging plasticity to occur. And we believe that, um, that that's occurring because you're reaching threshold levels of input into the brain. And if you think about it and you compare it to school, which is what I, how I often describe it to parents or your child learning the alphabet, you know, we don't just present the alphabet one day a week, right? We present it on their bed sheets. We present it on the refrigerator. We present, they go to school for multiple hours a day. We read them books. So they're getting all of this massive input. And so it creates a threshold level of input in the brain that allows the brains to make connections, but also to make connections permanently. And when children have had a disruption in how their brain is learning motor skills, we have to do that same process um, that to reach a threshold level of input about motor abilities, about sensory abilities, about coordination. We have to reach that threshold level of input into um, uh, create connections and that then, um, then can make those connections permanent. And especially since we're asking the brain to do this sometimes in ways that um, are alternate pathways in what a would have been typical. So that we need that, uh, that, uh, that amount of input to be at greater levels because we're asking the brain to make alternate pathways sometimes in what would have been typical. But I also think it's important for, for everyone to understand that um, it, it's not, even though the, they're alternate pathways, it doesn't mean that they can't develop. And that's how we kind of approached, you know, it's why the, the, neurologist said to you, or I'm assuming it was a neurologist said to you, let's wait and see, because we kind of approached it previously in science and in the clinical world, like motor skills was like this light switch. It was either on or it was off in the brain and the pathways are either there or what they weren't there. And neuroscience tells us differently. You know, it says that we can create these pathways. Um, they may be different, but everybody's brains wired a little bit differently. And so we need that threshold level and, and intensive epics of, tr of therapy just allow that input to be at a level that we have a, a chance of making those connections. You know, again, if we, if you wanted your child to learn to read and you read them a book once a week, they're, they're not likely to learn to read. And um, so I think that's how, how it works. In a, is, it, a, uh, is it like um, how they, they said uh, when you need to change uh, a behavior and you want to establish a, a, a new habit, uh, mm -hmm. like you want to uh, learn how to play piano and if you play piano for uh, 100 days, then after you start uh, playing piano. So it's like uh, rewiring our brain, it's, it's like this. So the intensive therapy, uh, in intensive treatments, uh, are working like this. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's a great um, uh, 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 analogy. But, you know, and also I always, I tell people, think about it with sports too. You know, kids play sports and they do all of that. But if, if for the competitive athletes, you know, they don't do things for an hour a week. You know, they do many, many hours a, a, a day. And so, and they're learning motor skills um, at that same, and, the, and those motor skills are more likely to change but similar to the piano or something like that, you have to do it every day and at a, a level that is sufficient to tell the brain that you not only want those connections um, to occur, but you want those connections to be permanent because that's the other thing is your brain is constantly making connections, but it doesn't always hold on to the connections. They can be transient if we don't have it, um, if they don't, 
if you don't reach kind of a second threshold of a level of input that says, okay, this is something this person's going to utilize over and over and over. And so we've got to make that connection permanent. And that's what doing it every day over and over and over that uh, repetitive practice, so to speak, allows for. But I also think that a good CIMT program or a good habit program, a good intensive therapy program builds on um, principles of learning that we've known for decades outside of the motor rehabilitation um, literature. So there are things we can do. There are rewards that we can use. There are ways of reward-based learning that the uh, brain responds to. And so a good intensive therapy program builds those uh, concepts of operant conditioning and things of that into the process so that the learning can be maximized. So before uh, going ahead, uh, Stephanie, do we want to make uh, any distinction between CIMT and HABIT? Uh, so just to let the, the families understand uh, how should they uh, start considering one program or another, or maybe in conjunction first uh, CIMT and then HABIT, just uh, up to you to, to better explain uh, the, the benefits of the two treatments. Okay. Yeah, so constraint-induced movement therapy and habit are both intensive therapies. They both utilize many hours of treatment every day for multiple weeks. Um, the difference is, is that um, constraint-induced movement therapy uses some type of constraint on a child uh, who has hemiparesis, um, stronger arm and hand. So um, uh, that can be a, a mitt to yes. prevent... Uh, okay. hand use, or we often use a cast so that children are literally casted from their, you know, in a, uh, with their elbow and bent and they wear it 24 seven, just like they had a broken arm. There's other people that use uh, uh, a resting hand splint. So there's all different types of constraints out there. Um, and then during the treatment process, you focus on a lot of unilateral skills but with some bimanual skills, and at the very end of most CIMT programs, there's a few days of bimanual treatment. Habit, on the other hand, does all the same things except for the constraint. And so it does, it's primarily focused on bimanual skills throughout the, um, uh, throughout the pro whole program. And both of them have found success in the literature. So we see changes occurring positively from both of them. Um, but it is also uh, uh, true that we usually see greater changes in bimanual skills from habit and you get some bumps in unimanual skills from CIMT. Um, there's been a, a handful of studies that have looked at utilizing um, uh, like one and then the other uh, and, and in differing ways, but we, we don't really understand yet if there if there's like a perfect order, um, you know whether you should do CIMT first and then habit or or habit and then CIMT. What, what I would say is that um, there are there are uh, positive aspects for both, and you have to think about what you, where your child's at. Um, I started in CIMT not because. Um, uh, most of my work's been there, although we've done some some work. We've got a study that is um, under analysis right now that actually directly compared um, CIMT to habit. I don't have the results yet, um, but I, because I think we need those types of scientific things to help us understand if there are direct comparisons as a first step in understanding which we should do first. I think both of them can be beneficial. But I think you have to think about where your child's at and what they've done previously. Personally, I, I firmly believe that you maximize the chances for bimanual abilities once you maximize unimanual abilities. So um, when I, I would recommend if you have a younger child, maybe starting with CIMT to maximize the development of that uh, weaker arm and hand, for lack of a better term. There's no really great term for describing the differences between the arms. Um, but I just think you have a better potential for maximizing uh, the use of a, of a bimanual approach once you have developed as many skills as you can unimanually. But I can't say that with firm scientific uh, uh, confidence yet. 
those studies need to be done where we directly compare them and then where we directly compare repeated dosages so that we can understand. Because I, I, could, I could play devil's advocate with myself and say, maybe you need to make sure the child is, is recognizing both our hands before you can really maximize unimanual skills. The other thing I've learned, though, through working with so many families is that families really know their kids the best, and we as professionals need to listen to them. And so you kind of know if your child's really struggling more unimanually or bimanually, and, and so we need to be able to hear them and say, you know, I believe in the intensive therapies, but we need to think, listen to the parents and, and understand where they think their child's development. I mean, I think that's the best advice we can use right now and in, um, in deciding which approach to use at what time. Um, the science may take us there in the future, but right now listening to the parents, I think is the best we can do. And, and do you think talking about uh, the, the type of uh, brain damage that uh, there are ideal candidates for one treatment or another? So, for example, uh, children coming from an ischemic stroke or a unilateral uh, damage uh, uh, could take more advantage of one or other treatments or as far as we know, we are uh, applying all these type of treatments so to all those kids who have uh, cerebral palsy in different type of uh, yeah. Oh, oh, um, I, you know, I don't know that I, I have confidence in, in the science yet that we can disentangle the type of stroke and the type of treatment that best match. I know there's been a couple of systematic reviews that have tried to look at that and say, can we disentangle it? But really, they haven't done well in disentangling it for uh, motor issues. The couple of systematic reviews I, I'm thinking of um, you know, found some differences in treatment types with things like executive functioning when there was executive functioning impairments and things of that nature. Um, thus far, most of the uh, studies that have looked at uh, habit and CIMT have found pretty uniformly that children of all different types of stroke can benefit. It might be a distinction about the um, amount of benefit, but I don't know that I have confidence in the science yet to say one particular brain lesion um, might benefit from one, from one versus the other. We may get there. Um, I think that there's even some work outside the uh, field uh, and other that's not got anything to do with cerebral palsy that also gives me pause about why, about answering that question, uh, because I think sometimes we 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 get a, 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 a we get an initial thing on a study and then we think oh we've got the answer and then subsequent science kind of says well maybe you didn't quite have the answer so i think children are benefiting from both and that's what we need to focus on right now and as the science unfolds maybe we'll be able to disentangle that um, I also don't fully think we understand completely those long term benefits which i think might play a distinction um, between CIMT and habit as well. Um, it might be that doing one early um, uh, versus late and then thinking about changes at 12 months or 24 months might be important to understand. So I, I just think the science is not quite where, where we can disentangle it yet. I, I ask also because, uh, you know, in the cerebral palsy umbrella, we have uh, uh, different type of or different grade of, uh, of, of impairments. Uh, so, for example, uh, parents uh, with uh, children with uh, diplegia were asking if their children, their child could benefit either on working on, on bimanual activities or uh, children uh, coming from a pediatric stroke with a dystonia, if they it could be could benefit either from from this type of, uh, of, of treatment. So uh, good, good to know that this could be uh, a topic for for the next uh, investigation. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So the, the, the next question is about, uh, it's, it's a very tough question, I, I believe, because uh, uh, it's, it's regarding the feminine involvement and the understanding of, of intensive therapy. And I ask him because um, also many families in, the, in, in our community were asking uh, 
uh, which is the, the role of the parents uh, during the, this burst of, of intensive therapy? What should they do? They should uh, uh, listen or um, watch the therapy during the treatment and try to apply uh, the same uh, type of treatment uh, at home, or should they just uh, watch from behind like a spectator? Because uh, uh, there's the ki this kind of... Uh, uh, I would say dialogue between the therapist and the parent and the therapist who say, so you, you should do the parent, so do not uh, exchange the roles and, and strictly re remain a parent. So uh, we, which is the role of the family involvement in this type of, uh, of a treatment, according to you? So um, I know it feels like I must be punting on a lot of answers, but I'm going to, um, but I'm going to kind of say it's a mixed answer. Um, so I'm a parent myself, and so I, I know that your own kids push all your and buttons. And you have a right? large panel for... <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, I mean, you know, I, I just cannot imagine trying to be a therapist for one of my children. I mean, it, it they, they know the buttons to push with me differently than, and, and they listen, you know, they come home from someone's house and they tell me, oh, your child was so well behaved, and I want to say, oh, are you talking about my child? I mean, every every parent has had that experience, right? And so um, I, I think that some parents can do this and some parents can't. And um, I, I also have had the privilege of working internationally in some lower um, income countries where we had to really kind of think outside of the box of um, how parent, you know, how we could apply this where there were not clinical facilities and literally there weren't therapists that could work with children at this intensive level. And so we've seen it be successful in those in, in those areas where they were kind of working with the with the therapist doing some and the parents doing some. So I absolutely think that some parents can do this. I don't think it's right for every parent and I think you have to know know your limits because above everything kids also need their safe zone, right? And that's the parents. That's never going to be the therapist. I mean, so so kids need that safe place to fall. And I want parents to always be that. So they, they need to first make sure that that's in place and that, you know, they can be parents first. And then if they can find ways of incorporating this, then I'm all for it. Um, uh, whether or not they do an intensive burst or whether or not they just learn from the process and a how to make their child's life more uh, therapeutic, for lack of a better term. So parents are often involved, families are often involved, and, and we, when we treat children, um, we do sometimes say, because children are sometimes less behaved when parents are around, we do say sometimes, can you look watch from around the corner because you're I'm going to get more of your child's attention but at the same time we start very right from the beginning saying I want you to think about your life and your child's life and learn from our process and think about how you can incorporate your child's um, uh, arm and hand into their daily life in new ways but we want you to think it through um, you know one of the questions I used to get asked uh, often by parents was, well, you've taught my child to be successful eating with their weaker arm and hand while they're here. Should we be making them do that? And I would always say no, because I don't want your dinner table to be a battleground every night, right? But if your child has a favorite cookie or something like that, then, you know, make that a rule. That child eats that cookie with that weaker arm and hand. And if they don't want to use that weaker arm and hand, don't fight with them, give them another cookie. So that you are kind of balancing and you're giving the child some control actually in you and learning to control that they've got a choice in using that arm and hand as well. Um, just like um, also another example I use is, you know, maybe your child can get their socks out of their drawer, right? Every day. And, but if that, Again, you want to choose that only if you live in a climate that allows it, because you've also, that child's got to maybe giving a hard day and you may have to be willing to let them go without their socks. So if it's 30, you know, if it's really cold outside, I'm, I hesitated because I said 30 degrees and that's in Fahrenheit and that's not Celsius. I couldn't do the <laughs> Fahrenheit, yes. <laughs> but my point is that you want to, you want to 
begin to give that child control. And that's really what I want parents to learn because I can convince every parent of every child with hemiparesis that it's a good thing for their child to use their arm and hand in their daily life. But if I don't convince the child and if I don't change their thought processes about it, I haven't done much. Ultimately, that's our goal, right? It's for them to use it in their daily life. And so I want parents to learn from the process and think about changing smaller things in their life to make that arm and hand a part of their natural life. Um, and then the few parents that it doesn't make any sense for them to participate in an intensive therapy clinically, but they really want to try it, then I want them to do it um, uh, in connection if they can get someone to work with them. And I want them to put defined limits on it, right? Again, so that they have their, they can be a parent first and their child won't feel like, oh, you know, this is just my mom nagging me forever about my arm and hand, which is what it can turn into. And, and that's not our goal. Does that make sense? I've kind of a long winded yes. answer. Yes, no, no, it makes sense because uh, everyone, uh, I think uh, all the mother of uh, children with uh, anemiparesis are familiar on the, on, on, on the way to speak to their children, like uh, when, when they are um, at, at, at the dining room, like having lunch to say, so please put your left <laughs> hand on, on, on the table. But I think that uh, from a parent point of view, it's a more kind of considering uh, the child uh, as a whole, so not in a silo, so not considering that in the morning you have the therapy, but then when you go back home, or you just forget of your hand right. or you do anything else. So absolutely, it, it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the next question is about, uh, uh, well, we, we spoke a lot uh, about the type of treatment and you also anticipated that uh, the topic of your current research is about the right dosage. So mm -hmm. this is something that the families are always asking uh, because uh, uh, due to local constraints, for example, uh, some uh, center here in Italy consider two or three hours a week an intensive treatment after Botox, for example. Uh, or other centers consider like uh, head days, uh, eight hours per day. So which could, which could be the, the right dosage to define uh, a correct intensive treatment? So um, as I said, the good news on this is that I think, I think even distributed practice models of therapy have gotten better. And I think that parents are, and family children are getting more and they're, they're more efficacious in the last um, uh, 10 years or so. We have just completed a study that came out in pediatrics looking at uh, dosage for older children. And as you said, the eye acquire is looking at dosage. But what we found in the um, study that just came out is we looked at um, uh, uh, what we thought of as a, our high dosage, which is uh, three hours a day for uh, uh, five days a week for four weeks. Um, and then we compared that to a group of children who got two and a half hours a day for three days a week for four weeks, and that was our lower dosage. And we did that because previously we had done a small scale study of dosage where we compared three hours a day to six hours a day, um, and we had found very similar results. So we felt like, well, that was a starting point. You were getting the same results at three and six hours a day. So now can we go lower? And, um, so hot to six, it means that, that there is a sense of frustration or comes out other negative uh, counter effect or? Well, so, uh, and maybe I should go through it historically. So we started off um, looking and we did, we're doing six hours a day and we, our very first studies were aimed at 10 days and then we expanded it to 20, 21 treatment days and then we went down to 20. But we did that based on the adult work. So that was our first clinical trial where we were doing six hours a day. Um, then we had, uh, we were lucky enough to that, um, a, a family actually gave us funding to look at dosage in a small clinical trial across sites. And that's where we did, we compared three hours a day to, um, uh, six, we compared six hours a day, I'm getting myself tongue-tied, into three hours a day. 
and we found very similar results, but it was on 18 children. So it was a really small sample. Um, and so then we did the study that just came out in pediatrics, which was a much larger sample, and it was across three different sites, and it ended up with 118 children. And that's where we said, okay, well, we got three and six hours, uh, pretty equivalent results. We didn't really see iatrogenic effects from the six hours or negative effects. Uh, they were just very similar. So, but what if we go a little bit lower? So we didn't do the six hours on the study that just came out. We did, we compared it then to the two and a half hours of three times a week. So um, we, it was roughly half the dosage, but it was just that three days a week of two and a half versus three hours every day. And what we found there was that dosage overwhelmingly um, uh, was, a, was a big component. So the two and a half hours a day, uh, children got better, but they were, they got better at the same rate as the group of children that was in usual and customary care. So whereas the three hour kids got better ac across almost all measures at a little bit higher rate. So all children benefited even from traditional distributed practice model. Um, but you, you only got the, the larger benefits if you went at least to that three hours a day. But that also, um, I said that it was also a, a, the study that showed us that regular therapy, even distributed practice models were changing because when we did our first clinical trial um, uh, 20 years ago or so now, uh, on average, kids were getting 2.2 hours of therapy a week. If, and that was if you put PT and OT and speech and everything together. What we found in this latest study was that children on average were getting um, four, uh, four and a half hours of therapy a week. And that was really just about OT and PT. And so kids were getting at a higher dosage, but they were also, um, there were some kids getting very high dosages. So the, the range of dosages was, even in traditional practices, was much more varied. And we think that that's why we were getting better benefits, even from uh, the the traditional care models. And that's why we couldn't find a distinction from even that 15 hour dosage, which was our lower dosage. Now, interestingly enough, if you kind of now go fast forward to I acquire, we are now going back and comparing the three hours, which is the dose that we found efficacious to the six hours, but a day. Um, but the reason we're doing that one is it's because it's never been done in infants. And so there might be some, um, there might be a, there might be a suggestion that infants could benefit from even a, an even higher dosage. Maybe you would uh, create more uh, opportunities for brain development. Um, but also, we felt like we never truly answered that question completely uh, because of the small sample size. So, in I acquire, we will ultimately have 240 children in comparison to the 18 children in the first uh, clinical trial. So we felt like it was an opportunity to really understand if that even higher dosage ha has a, a potential that we didn't want to miss something from not investigating that higher dosage again. Clear. It's kind of, a, again, a long-winded answer to your question. I don't, I, for families, I think what we, what I can say is that these previous results suggest that if you're not doing at least three hours a day um, for multiple weeks um, every day, then you probably are getting similar benefits to what you would get from usual and customary care. And I say that based on what children get here. And I'm not, in all honesty, I don't know how different, you know, the number of hours that your children might get in, in, um, in Italy. So one hour per week, it's, right. it's like so, up to 10 years. And then from 10 years or homeward, uh, it's, it's done. So, so what I would say is that right now, if you're looking at an intensive model, then I would at least look for that three hours a day for, um, you know, every day for a couple of weeks. Um, you know, I do think you don't have to do it like 10 consecutive days or, but you, of course, you need, everybody needs their breath on the weekend, even the kids, I think. But I think that multiple weeks of three hours a day is what, I, if I were looking for an intensive therapy program, I don't think I would. I couldn't recommend one at this point based on the science lower than that. 
good. Good to know. It's it's very useful. Also, thinking about um, the the next question uh, that is a bit connected to this, to, to what you just uh, share. So there are a lot of clinics, uh, especially private clinics in, I would say, in the eastern part of Europe that are offering uh, to parents. I'm sure that there are in U.S. too. Yeah. <laughs> They're offering uh -huh. to, to family, especially to most critical situation, uh, period of uh, intensive treatments of, of multiple type of therapies. So mm -hmm. the child even... Uh, very little children uh, uh, can stay there uh, for um, three weeks and every day they have a kind of schedule like uh, eight hours per day in which they do like uh, multiple sessions of uh, speech therapy, occupational therapy, mm -hmm. um, swimming uh, with, with right. the dolphins or very exotic things that uh, they think that could uh, uh, could, could work also on this. Do, do we have uh, any kind of scientific evidences on this? So how much the multiple sessions of different type of treatment uh, could, could benefit this type of children? Well, I think what you have to remember when you're talking about lumping a lot of things together is that we all only have so much capacity, right? And so what you end up doing many times is diluting the process if you are actually um, working on, if you are targeting, say, an hour of speech, an hour of your arm, an hour of your leg, an hour of your education, if you're diluting it down to an hour of this, that, and the other, then you have to be careful. That being said, um, a, a good intensive therapy program always recognizes the child as a whole. So it is true that when you think about constraint-induced movement therapy, most people think about their arm. But if, if I, if, when I'm training a therapist, I never train them to just think about the arm because you use your arm in context of the rest of your body and the rest of your life. So if I'm working with a child who isn't talking, for example, we always incorporate things like um, sign language or asking them to think about their speech and you know explicitly asking them to to um, answer their questions or if a child that has executive functioning issues we might ask we might might build in you make a choice you know I'm going to give you this or this and you have to choose which one so we're but this is those. not a speech therapy this is motor but it's not that's yeah. exactly the right it's not speech therapy I I want to recognize that that child know that development doesn't occur in a vacuum, and I ultimately want um, want the child to be focused on their motor development. Um, and with CIMT, likely with that arm and hand or even habit, but I don't want you know it doesn't mean that we're never going to think about the child's trunk or their walking or their speech. So I think you need to be cautious that that a program isn't diluting it to, you know, 10 therapists a day coming to see my child and working on 10 different things. I mean, think about if you had a job that way. I mean, you you it's like resetting every hour and you don't, you know, you're not as productive versus if you are doing something and you're thinking about it intensely for a very long period of time. So I think we have to give children the opportunities to 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 create that mass practice focused on a limited amount of things versus trying to hit everything. Um, I, I, but I don't. Th but I also don't want to dismiss that therapists need to children. They need to be aware of the whole child. Um, you know, I, CIMT or habit is not about picking up a hundred blocks a day. It's about you know, stacking those blocks and then going over here and doing something else and getting dressed and eating. It's about those life skills. And for that, you've got to be aware of other things like speech and the lower extremity and the trunk and all the all the other parts of the child's life. And I, and I think this is also the, the latest great evidence that we uh, are aiming from the latest studies, the fact that uh, goal-directed uh, uh, treatment are more uh, efficient compared to the passive type of treatment. So exactly uh, opening up a box for 100 times or, or things like this. 
absolutely. I mean, I think it's um, the, the literature is suggesting that goal directed is important um, more for kids than even for adults because you can make you can make an adult and and maybe even older kids late adolescents you could make an argument that if you do this a hundred times you know it, it will make a difference but for young kids it, it's got to be functional and you've got to you've got to give them a reason to want to do it so I, you're absolutely right i think that's why you know goal directed treatment is a part of this and that's why that's one of the reasons Habit and CIMT have been effective is because they've been goal directed from the start. Um, and it, it really isn't, I think that while there's uh, repetitive task practice in it, and that's important repetition, but I also think that um, a good program is always goal directed and it has been from the start. And, and, and also gives uh, a reason uh, to the to the robotic uh, devices. So the fact that probably there's a stage in your life in which uh, a machine uh, can do the, right. the, the type of passive treatment. So going towards the, the last uh, questions, uh, I know that you are uh, most familiar with uh, with the motor outcomes and, and also this is the, the type of your work. But do you think, or again, is there any kind of evidence that uh, the type of intensive treatment that you apply uh, to the motor impairments is something that can be applicable also to the uh, speech treatment mm -hmm. or cognitive functions treatment? Is there, so this method of having a burst of treatment uh, uh, could teach new behavior also in, in different fields? Yeah, I absolutely think it's applicable, and we're beginning to do some work um, with children who have other types of uh, uh, diagnoses, not only in the motor field. You, um, I think it's a different process, but um, with speech and with executive functioning and um, uh, all sorts of other types of um, uh, disorders, for lack of a better term, um, and I think that the reason it has the potential to be efficacious is because, I mean, it's the same principles of learning and the way we change the brain. So I think that if you're trying to develop speech, for example, the um, you're, it's the same types of learning principles, you know, that you need to reach a threshold level of input, and then you need to make that input, uh, uh, those connections in the brain to be permanent. And so I think it can be applicable across almost all therapeutic areas. I do think it needs to be tailored to each therapeutic area. Um, you mentioned dystonia earlier. You, you probably uh, know that um, in dystonia has probably, it's been the one area where CIMT, for example, and Habit have struggled to find efficacy. But I think that it's not that intensive therapies um, altered appropriately might be appropriate for dystonia, but they need to be altered because with dystonia, for example, you're often trying to teach um, uh, inhibitory pathways as well as excitatory pathways. So for, to, you know, when we think about a child with hemiparesis in contrast, you're often thinking about excitatory, you know, starting a process. For a child with dystonia, it's not just about starting a process, but it's about controlling other things so that you can inhibit some things while starting another thing. And so I think the approach has to be different, but it doesn't mean intensive therapies can't be uh, beneficial. Um, and of course, there's been a handful of studies with these some of these other targets and um, in adults also. Uh, but even what we see with CIMT and habit, one of the most common things we began to uh, realize early on is that parents would tell us after treatment that, you know, my child's speech changed or my child's attention process changed. And those were not things we were targeting, but those were things that were changing. Now, I don't, we don't know all the reasons why that occurs, but I think it's also, if you just think about brain function, um, our brains aren't in a vacuum either. So one area changes and that increases the connectivity to other areas and it likely increases that area of the brain's ability to create plast plasticity and to create development. And so I think, you know, it can have uh, downstream effects, these intensive therapy processes. 
It reminds me what um, I, I guess you know Patricia Mussolino from uh, the Massachusetts Children's Hospital. <laughs> she always <laughs> says, uh, so let's expose the children to multiple experience. So exactly what you we were saying, do not limit uh, the fact that can do, they can do sport or uh, outdoor activities because this is the, the, the real treatment, the real therapy that uh, is able to uh, to um, exploit the, the, the number of connection they can do so. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, and I think that's, that's, you know, that's to some ways it goes back to even your, your, it's the same, it's a different job, a different trajectory, but it's what we try to do as all parents. We try to make sure we expose our children to productive experiences across the board. And um, uh, we just have a different set of, of, maybe experiences that children with specific diagnoses need to be exposed to. And so we just, but we need to build them in so that we are creating as many experiences as possible to maximize development. Exactly, exactly. So the last question, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, because we are talking about uh, intensive treatment and then uh, going back to everyday life. So how is transitioning to everyday life for parents, for children? So before you mentioned uh, the need to have a follow up at six and 12 months, but uh, what could happen uh, later on or what is based on your experience or what should you recommend uh, to, to the families? So um, I, I think uh, what I said earlier for just a one transition is very true, is that parents need to learn and pick some specific things that they can make therapeutic in their child's life. And they need to think about and begin that process even at the start of an intensive therapy okay, and, and, and watch what their child learns and then think about ways they can make it generalizable to their everyday life. So I gave the example of the sock or the cookie. So, you know, but I don't want them to create battlegrounds. And I definitely don't want this to be, you know, like an exercise regimen, which is what people think. Um, you know, I don't want you to sit down and say, okay, you have to use your arm and hand just for 20 minutes every day. Um, because what that says to the child is there's a start and a stop point. Right. I want them to think about their daily life and how they can be productive. Now, it doesn't mean that if if you want to add on some practice for 20 minutes a day or whatever, that that might not be productive. But as far as generalizing to the child's life situation, I, I would um, I want them to think about how to incorporate those skills into the daily life, you know, what, but, but I want them to be selective and choosy. So I don't want them to, I'm not looking to set up battlegrounds where, you know, mom and dad are just always nagging and I'm never willing to do that activity because it means I have to do this with my left arm or my right arm. Um, so I want them to be, I want them to be um, thoughtful about the way they are thinking about generalizing. Um, sessions of practice if they can incorporate that into their life and and they can be the the therapist for those few minutes I'm not against it but I think even that I think that they have to be picky and choosy and and learn what makes what works for their family and um and to be those parents first um I do think that I have had the opportunity now um there's a handful of children that um I've gotten to follow by seeing on repeated occasions through the years. And that's kind of the last topic on this I, I would want to bring up is I don't know that that's right for every child, but I do think that if you have the opportunity, there might be, um, it might be uh, advantageous for repeated epics of, of intensive therapies, maybe a CIMT, maybe in a habit or vice versa. And then across a, a different developmental points for children, um, I think that needs to be considered. And, uh, we, you know, what we see from the evidence is that children by far make the first, the largest gains on that first session, but they can make continued gains. And I think they're appropriate at different developmental points um, with children. So, that, you know, when a child's getting ready to go to school, for example, there may be a different set of skills that you didn't work on if you if you did a CIMT program when a child was three, you know, at five or six, those skills are different. And so you might 
you know, that might be another time. We don't have all the science to say, do this um, every year or every six months or every other year. We don't have the science to say what's exactly appropriate. So I think, again, we have to listen to the parents. But I do think there are there are potential benefits. And if I could snap my fingers and change the, the rehabilitation world, what I would do is, is start seeing children early. And then I would do every six months or a year for the first few years of their life. And then, um, and then I would work with parents about what, because I think at that point you going on different developmental trajectories and, and you would want to work with parents about once a year or once every other year or something along those lines until children have, until parents and the child themselves feels like they've maximized their process. Um, because again, I said earlier, I think we have to convince the child. And so, you know, very early on, we have to begin to listen to them about what they think is appropriate. And, um, and I think that can never be dismissed. Great. Great. So thank you again, Stephanie, for, for your time. We envision a period in which the telemedicine could also let our families uh, participate to, to your trial and also uh, the role of our individualized medicine, personalized medicine could really uh, make a, a permanent change in, in the life of these uh, children with, with cerebral palsy. So thanks again, Stephanie, and please feel free to leave us uh, all the details so we can share them with, uh, with the family if they are willing to, to apply or just ask for more references. I will send you, um, I'll send you the, uh, the uh, link to iAcquire along with the um, the flyer that you feel free to distribute to families. Um, I can also send you the pediatrics paper if that's helpful that just came Perfect. out. And um, let me take this opportunity to thank you for all you've done because um, I've been watching you since um, I, I think you started on this very early when Mario was probably just an infant. And I, um, I just applaud parents that can um, take this and make it an advocacy opportunity because I know you faced many difficulties in your own life. And, and so I just thank you for being the advocate for not only your child, but you've been the advocate for so many other children. And um, I just, it, that makes such a difference. And I just couldn't let this opportunity go without thanking you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. We share these, uh, these compliments with the whole community. So <laughs> thank you. Well, Ciao. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>